Chapter 2, Nutritionism Defined The term isn't mine. It was coined by an Australian sociologist of science by the name of Gregory Screenace, and as near as I can determine, first appeared in a 2002 essay called Sorry Marge, published in an Australian quarterly called Mean Gen. Sorry Marge looked at margarine as the ultimate nutritionist product, able to shift its identity, no cholesterol one year, no trans fats the next, depending on the prevailing winds of dietary opinion. But Screenies had bigger game on his sites than spreadable vegetable oil. He suggested that we look past the various nutritional claims swirling around margarine and butter and consider the underlying message of the debate itself. Quote, namely, that we should understand and engage with food and our bodies in terms of their nutritional and chemical constituents and requirements, the assumption being that this is all we need to understand. End quote. This reductionist way of thinking about food has been pointed out and criticized before, notably by the Canadian historian Harvey Levenstein and the British nutritionist Geoffrey Cannon, and the American nutritionists Joan Gousseau and Marion Nestle, but had never before been given a proper name. Nutritionism. Proper names have a way of making visible things we don't easily see or simply take for granted. The first thing to understand about nutritionism is that it is not the same thing as nutrition. As the ism suggests, it's not a scientific subject, but an ideology. Ideologies are ways of organizing large swaths of life and experience under a set of shared but unexamined assumptions. This quality makes an ideology particularly hard to see, at least while it's still exerting its hold on your culture. A reigning ideology is a little like the weather, all pervasive and so virtually impossible to escape. Still, we can try. In the case of nutritionism, the widely shared but unexamined assumption is that the key to understanding food is indeed the nutrient. Put another way, Foods are essentially the sum of their nutrient parts. From this basic premise flow several others. Since nutrients, as compared with foods, are invisible and therefore slightly mysterious, it falls to the scientists, and to the journalists through whom the scientists reach the public, to explain the hidden reality of foods to us. In form, this is a quasi-religious idea, suggesting the visible world is not the one that really matters, which implies the need for a priesthood. To enter a world where your dietary salvation depends upon unseen nutrients, you need plenty of expert help. But expert help to do what, exactly? This brings us to another unexamined assumption of nutritionism, that the whole point of eating is to maintain and promote bodily health. Hippocrates' famous injunction to let food be thy medicine is ritually invoked to support this notion. I'll leave the premise alone for now, except to point out that it is not shared by all cultures and, further, that the experience of these other cultures suggests that, paradoxically, regarding food as being about other things than bodily health, like pleasure, say, or sociality or identity, makes people no less healthy. Indeed, there's some reason to believe it may make them more healthy. This is what we usually have in mind when we speak of the French paradox. So there is at least a question as to whether the ideology of nutritionism is actually any good for you. It follows from the premise that food is foremost about promoting physical health, that the nutrients in food should be divided into the healthy ones and the unhealthy ones, good nutrients and bad. This has been a hallmark of nutritionist thinking from the days of Liebig, for whom it wasn't enough to identify the nutrients, he also had to pick favorites, and nutritionists have been doing so ever since. Liebig claimed that protein was the, quote, master nutrient in animal nutrition, because he believed it drove growth. Indeed, he likened the role of protein in animals to that of nitrogen in plants, Protein, which contains nitrogen, comprised of the essential human fertilizer. Liebig's elevation of protein dominated nutritionist thinking for decades as public health authorities worked to expand access to and production of the master nutrient, especially in the form of animal protein, with the goal of growing bigger and therefore it was assumed healthier people, a high priority for Western governments fighting imperial wars. To a considerable extent, we ha still have a food system organized around the promotion of protein as the master nutrient. It has given us, among other things, vast amounts of cheap meat and milk, which have in turn given us much, much bigger people. Whether they are healthier, too, is another question. It seems to be a rule of nutritionism that for every good nutrient, there must be a bad nutrient to serve as its foil, the latter a focus for our food fears and the former for our enthusiasms. A backlash against protein arose in America at the turn of the last century as diet gurus like John Harvey Kellogg and Horace Fletcher, about whom more later, railed against the delirious effects of protein on digestion, it supposedly led to the proliferation of toxic bacteria in the gut, and promoted the cleaner, more wholesome carbohydrate in its place. The legacy of that revolution is the breakfast cereal, the strategic objective of which was to dethrone animal protein in the morning meal. Ever since, the history of modern nutritionism has been a history of macronutrients at war, protein against carbs, carbs against proteins, and then fats, 
Fats against carbs. Beginning with Liebig, in each age, nutritionism has organized most of its energies around an imperial nutrient, protein in the 19th century, fat in the 20th, and as it stands to reason, carbohydrates will occupy our attention in the 21st. Meanwhile, in the shadow of these titanic struggles, smaller civil wars have raged within the sprawling empires of the big three. Refined carbohydrates versus fiber, animal protein versus plant protein, saturated fats versus polyunsaturated fats, and then, deep down within the province of the polyunsaturates, omega-3 fatty acids versus omega-6s. Like so many ideologies, nutritionism at bottom hinges on a form of dualism, so that at all times there must be an evil nutrient for adherence to excoriate, and a savior nutrient for them to sanctify. At the moment, trans fats are performing admirably in the former role, omega-3 fatty acids in the latter. It goes without saying that such a Manichaean view of nutrition is bound to promote food fads and phobias and large abrupt swings of the nutritional pendulum. Another potentially serious weakness of nutritionist ideology is that, focused so relentlessly as it is on the nutrients it can measure, it has trouble discerning qualitative distinctions among foods. So fish, beef, and chicken, through the nutritionist's lens, become mere delivery systems for varying quantities of different fats and proteins and whatever other nutrients happen to be on their scope. Milk, through this lens, is reduced to a suspension of protein, lactose, fats, and calcium in water, when it is entirely possible that the benefits, or for that matter hazards, of drinking milk owe entirely to other factors, growth hormones, or relationships between the factors, fat-soluble vitamins and saturated fat, that have been overlooked. Milk remains a food of humbling complexity, to judge by the long, sorry saga of efforts to simulate it. The entire history of baby formula has been the history of one overlooked nutrient after another. Liebig missed the vitamins and amino acids, and his successors missed the omega-3s, and still to this day, babies fed on the most nutritionally complete formula failed to do as well as babies fed on human milk. Even more than margarine, infant formula stands as the ultimate test product of nutritionism and the fair index of its hubris. This brings us to one of the most troubling features of nutritionism, though it is a feature certainly not troubling to all. When the emphasis is on quantifying the nutrients contained in foods, or to be precise, the recognized nutrients in foods, any qualitative distinction between whole foods and processed foods is apt to disappear. Quote, if foods are understood only in terms of the various quantities of nutrients they contain, Gregory Screenus wrote, then even processed foods may be considered to be healthier for you than whole foods if they contain the appropriate quantities of some nutrients. How convenient. 